Gary Johnson. Gary, Gary, Gary. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail because I'm sure at least some of you have already seen my rant against Gary from last September after his gaffes, what is Aleppo, and uh, things of that nature. But I will say this. Part of the reason why so many libertarians and libertarian sympathizers were excited about this election and Gary Johnson's prospects in this election was that the two major party candidates had such high, historically high, personal unfavorability ratings. The idea was this is an unprecedented opportunity because the two major party candidates are so widely despised and distrusted by so many ordinary Americans, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump both. Never mind that the one who had even higher personal unfavorability ratings ended up winning the damn election, but I digress. This might be the big golden opportunity for libertarians to finally put themselves and our philosophy on the map in a big way with the American people, like never before. Unfortunately, I suspect that that very factor may very well have backfired against us. At first, I got the impression that, especially in the spring and the summer, particularly after Trump and Clinton sold up their respective party nominations, a lot of folks were willing to consider voting third party in general or for Gary Johnson in particular because of how little they trusted Trump and Clinton. I remember taking a, a, a bus ride last summer in which I overheard a lady sitting across the aisle from me talking on the phone to a friend or relative of hers about Gary Johnson and about how she was considering voting for him. So I did what I considered to be my civic duty. And after she was done with her phone conversation, I leaned across the aisle, got her attention, and chatted her up for a while. She was, I think, a middle-aged white woman. And um, it was obvious that she was relatively moderate with maybe some leftward leanings, but it sounded like her leftward leanings were in the social realm and the foreign policy realm. And so she was sympathetic to what little she'd heard about Gary Johnson and libertarianism in general so far. So, you know, I tried to have an honest conversation with her about his strengths, some of his apparent weaknesses as they appeared to me at that time. Bear in mind, this was July or I think early August of 2016 before what is Aleppo and all of that nonsense. It sounded at the end of our conversation like she might very well have gone for Johnson in the end. I haven't seen her or spoken to her since. This was a random occurrence. I don't expect to ever meet this, uh, this lady again. Did she actually end up voting for Johnson on Tuesday or perhaps before? Who knows? But I wouldn't be surprised if she didn't, particularly after the string of gaps that he committed at the end of the summer and the beginning of the fall. The whole factor of Trump's and Clinton's unlikability may have played a role in convincing her and other voters like her who were considering voting for Johnson not to do so in the end. Why? Because if Trump in particular really was so awful, and you know I agree that he was and is so awful, if not more awful than he appeared to be on the campaign trail, maybe that convinced a lot of voters to stick with Clinton after all. And it may have happened on both sides of the aisle in both parties. Voters who normally voted Republican may have decided, I can't vote for Johnson in the end because I can't risk allowing Hillary Clinton to become president. Voters who normally vote Democratic may have thought, I'd like to vote for Gary, but I just can't bring myself to do it because I can't risk having Trump in the Oval Office. Although the personal unfavorability of the two candidates probably succeeded for a while in bringing a lot more limelight and publicity to Gary Johnson and to a lesser extent, Jill Stein as well, the Green Party nominee. In the end, I suspect it may have caused a lot of voters to stampede back into the ranks of the two major parties precisely for that reason. The main factor in this election that seemed to give Gary Johnson and libertarians in general a fighting chance for the first time ever, really, appears to have done us in. Maybe. Of course, it's possible that uh, further analysis of exit polls and the like will show that a lot of the voters who were toying with the idea of voting for Johnson but ended up breaking for Hillary or Trump may not have done it for that reason. But I strongly suspect that very factor probably played some role in it. And I don't know that I can really blame those voters. Even I myself always said from the beginning, I would only have voted for Gary Trump. For Gary Trump, wow. I would only have voted for Gary Johnson if I lived in a state that was safe, either solidly red or solidly blue, a state that was guaranteed to go for either Hillary or Trump, because that's the circumstance in which I would have been able to afford to vote for any third party candidate. But if I lived in a swing state, if I lived in Pennsylvania or Virginia or North Carolina or Florida or Ohio or the like, or other states that aren't usually swing states but became swing states in effect in this election, places like Michigan and Wisconsin, if I lived in any of those places, I would have voted for Hillary Clinton because keeping Trump out of the White House had to be the priority. Now look, I don't know. I do know that Gary's supporters in general weren't making the same nuanced recommendation to the voters that I did. 
And even I probably didn't emphasize that caveat enough. <laughs> well, I'm not going to pretend to have had any impact on how almost anyone out there voted, except maybe that lady with whom I had that conversation on the bus, because how many people actually watch these damn videos anyway? But obviously Gary and Bill Weld themselves were not going to say, vote for us. If you live in one of the majority states that aren't swing states, if you vote in a battleground state, vote for Hillary. I guess Bill Weld sort of uh, hinted at that, and there was some scandal that he caused earlier in the fall when it sounded like he was actually campaigning for Hillary Clinton rather than for his own ticket. But when he was uh, asked about that more directly, he said, no, make no mistake, you know, we are running for president and I totally endorse Gary. Who knows? The impression I get is that deep down Bill Weld knew that the priority had to be keeping Trump out of the White House. We Gary Johnson supporters really don't have much, if anything, to show for our uh, passionate defenses of the man. We hoped he would at least make it into the presidential campaign debates. He didn't make it into the debates. We hoped he would win at least 5% of the popular vote so that the LP could have official party status in future elections and potentially public funding for their election campaigns. He failed to achieve that too. So, what are we to make of this? Now, I'm seeing some folks in the Liberty Movement saying Gary's failure proves not only that he was a bad candidate, which I agree with, but also that what we need is a candidate who will stick to his guns and stick to libertarian orthodoxy and not make concessions to liberal or conservative viewpoints. I totally disagree on that front. Libertarian ideology in its purest form is just not politically palatable to the vast majority of Americans, even to those who've heard of it. Most Americans will not go for abolishing the welfare state completely, abolishing entitlement programs. Most American voters won't go for that. Hell, I don't go for it. That's why I'm always saying I'm such a heterodox, unconventional libertarian. I'm the kind of libertarian whom a lot of libertarians say is not really a libertarian. Later for those people. I think what's really critical is having a liberty ethic that you bring to the table and having a libertarian ideological compass. As I've said before, my libertarianism is a compass, not a straitjacket. Those libertarians for whom it is a straitjacket, who feel that they have to pass X number of litmus tests on certain public policy issues in order just to qualify as libertarians at all, <laughs> we would be shooting ourselves in the foot royally to nominate characters like that. What we need is a brand of libertarianism that takes account of real world realities, not only when it comes to the inherent feasibility of certain policies, but also their political feasibility. How many voters out there are really willing to countenance a minarchist state? a night watchman state in which the government preserves law and order, enforces contracts, protects this country, the United States, but not any other country from attack and from foreign threats and nothing more. Sorry, no. The country left that kind of paradigm behind at least as early as the New Deal, if not even earlier. And because of how dependent so many ordinary people have become on government assistance of one form or another, the country's never turning back. It's just not realistic. My libertarianism is the kind of libertarianism you'll find from sources like the recently founded Niskanen Institute, which seek to make government as minimally intrusive and coercive as possible without entertaining any delusions about eliminating the government role in ordinary Americans' lives at all. I continue to believe that that's the kind of nominee the Libertarian Party would need in the future in order to have a hope of becoming politically relevant. But at the end of the day, Gary Johnson, it turned out, was not that man. I suspect that that's more because of the fact that I mentioned earlier, the dangerousness or perceived dangerousness of the two major party candidates, which actually, I suspect, motivated a lot of voters to stick with the other major party candidate instead of rolling the dice on a third party candidate. And I think it's also because of the personal flaws that Gary revealed too late to do much about it <laughs> in terms of whether he should have been the nominee of the Libertarian Party or not. What can I say? You live, you learn, you dribble, you shoot, you hope for the best. You take a gamble on these politicians and hope that they'll do right by you, hope they'll do right by the country, hope they won't let you down. Sometimes they do. I do suspect that the very factor that made Gary more relevant for a while probably did him in in the end. It appears that in order to get elected and have a direct influence on the political process, libertarians will probably need to work with the two major parties. That's arguably unfortunate given the orientation of the two major parties, but clearly Third parties just have too hard a time getting the attention that they need and being taken seriously, not just by the media or by the major parties, but at the end of the day, by the voters. So that's one potential lesson of this for libertarians and supporters of third parties in general. I would say the same thing to supporters of Jill Stein and the Green Party. It looks like the lesson of this for folks like us out on the fringes of the political process is if you can't beat them, you might have to join them.